Our next speaker is Dr. Sushma Kribb. She's one of the pulmonary and critical care faculty from the Atlanta VA. She has a lot of interest in HIV and the critical care, critical care population. We'll talk to us about that. So, good morning, everyone. Thanks to Dr. Fisher and Dr. Martin for having me here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about HIV in the ICU and where we are in 2015. So the objectives of my talk, I'm going to start by discussing the incidents and ideologies of critical illness among HIV-infected patients in the era of antiretroviral therapy, or ART. I'm going to describe outcomes for critically ill HIV-infected patients in this era, and I'm going to compare and contrast the potential risks and benefits of ART initiation. So to this day, HIV continues to be a big problem. The WHO estimated that in 2012, there were 35.3 million people living with HIV, of which 3.4 million were actually Around that same time, there were 2.5 million newly infected people with HIV and 1.6 million AIDS were Now, the first published report of AIDS came about in 1981, when five young males were diagnosed with pneumocystis carinii in the middle. Now, combination therapy against HIV, known as highly active antiretroviral therapy, or combination antiretroviral therapy, came about between 1996 and 1997. It also became widely used around that time. With that, you saw a significant decline in AIDS-related deaths, and the number of people living with HIV has steadily increased. Now, with the introduction of antiretroviral therapy, hospitalization rates for HIV-infected have also This graph here shows data from the National Hospital Discharge Survey showing the hospitalization rates between 1996 and 2010. So you can see the blue line, which represents the HIV-infected patients, has decreased considerably from about 30 hospitalizations per 100 persons with the infection to about five. But despite this, MICU admissions have either been stable or increased. So it's estimated that about 3 to 12% of all hospitalized patients require ICU admission. About 25 to 40% of these patients, their HIV status is unknown, and they don't know that they have HIV when they're admitted to the ICU. Thus, many HIV patients are not on ART at the time of ICU. But with antiretroviral therapy, HIV patients are living longer, and they're developing more comorbid illness. And these non-AIDS illnesses are actually accounting majority of deaths. So with the introduction of antiretroviral therapy, the spectrum of critical illness has changed for HIV patients. It's in the pre-ART era, HIV patients in the ICU were mostly young men with opportunistic infection and advanced. But now, as I mentioned, HIV patients are living longer and they're developing more non-AIDS-related illnesses. So it's estimated now that more than 50% of ICU admissions are for these non-AIDS such as cardiovascular disease, chronic pulmonary disease, liver disease. We call these HIV-associated non-AIDS conditions, or HANA conditions. It's thought that they tend to occur with increased frequency among HIV-infected patients and may progress more rapidly compared to demographically similar non-AIDS. Now, although HIV patients are developing more of these HANA conditions, the most common ICU diagnosis is still respiratory failure. It's just that now the pathogen. So instead of seeing more pneumocystis, bacterial infections are much more. HIV has been associated with a higher frequency of severe sepsis. And although hospitalization rates are declining, admission rates for sepsis have remained. Now, chronic alcohol abuse, substance abuse, and smoking, which are seen often in HIV infected patients, also contribute to the risk of critical illness. Now, investigators recently analyzed data from the Veterans Aging Cohort Study, or VAC, which is a prospective ongoing study of HIV-infected veterans. And the VAC's risk index, which is a measure of HIV-specific and general organ injury, has been validated to predict all-cause mortality. So these investigators hypothesized that the VAX index could predict the risk for hospitalization and MICU admission in HIV. Now, this table here shows you the variables that compose the VAX index. It includes age, sex, race, and a number of clinical lab measures that are all weighted to 
produce a composite score that predicts an individual's five-year mortality. And what they found was that HIV patients admitted to the MICU had more advanced HIV, a higher VAC score, and an increased prevalence of these HANA Now, in the pre-ART era, hospital survival for critically ill HIV patients was pretty dismal, about 9 to 30 percent. But now, in the post-ART era, survival has increased considerably and is reported to be close to 60 to 80 percent. Of course, this coincides with the development of antiretroviral therapy, but there could be other factors contributing as well, such as low tidal volume ventilation and early goal directed therapy. Now, although hospital survival has increased considerably for critically ill HIV affected patients, when you compare HIV to non HIV patients, long term mortality is still higher among the HIV infected. But it's unclear if hospital and ICU survival is particularly different. The studies here are conflicting. We found in our own study, done here in Atlanta, Georgia, at our county hospital, that HIV patients with severe sepsis had a higher mortality compared to non-HIV patients with sepsis. So some risk factors for increased mortality include mechanical ventilation, delayed ICU admission, sepsis, age, and severity of illness. Now, you'll note here that CD4 count and viral load are not on this list. Um, they have not been consistently predictive of mortality. So I'm going to digress a little bit and talk about disparities in healthcare because I think this is very important and relevant when it comes to taking care of HIV patients. So there are likely a number of factors that play a role in the healthcare disparities we see between HIV and non-HIV patients with respect to ICU care and outcomes. Access to medical care and health insurance likely play a role. Uninsured patients are more likely to be admitted to the ICU when admitted and are more likely to So researchers noted that in order for HIV patients to fully benefit from antiretroviral therapy, a number of steps have to happen. First, they need to be diagnosed with HIV. Well, that makes sense. You need to know that you have the virus. They have to be engaged in care. They have to be prescribed antiretroviral therapy. And they have to take it so that they can become virally suppressed. So these investigators also noted that there were a number of obstacles to achieving these. And so they established the HIV care. Now, President Obama in 2013 established that HIV care continuum initiative, which is really directing federal departments towards prioritizing these goals again, which are to diagnose HIV, the linkage to care and the retention in care, the receipt of antiretroviral therapy, and achieving viral suppression. Now you can see looking at this graph here that we still have a, a ways to go. So of the, in the United States, of the 1.2 million people living with HIV, it's estimated that about 14% of them don't even know that they have HIV, and only about 40% Now, the impact of antiretroviral therapy on ICU survival is conflicting. The studies are retrospective. They're generally not powered to detect differences by ART. And as I mentioned earlier, many patients are not on antiretroviral therapy at the time of admission, which makes this comparison even more difficult. And there's really no prospective st studies evaluating the safety, efficacy, and timing of antiretroviral therapy. But of course, there are a number of benefits to using ART in the ICU. We know it improves immune function. It reduces the risk from opportunistic infections and neoplasms, and in some cases, may be the only therapy patients have. Studies have also shown that patients who are continued on antiretroviral therapy or are initiated on antiretroviral therapy in the ICU may have a survival benefit compared to those patients who are not on. And treatment interruptions in these drugs can have significant consequences. It can lead to virus mutations as early as three months after the drugs are stopped, leading to drug resistance. Um, in the SMART study published in the New England Journal in 2006, it showed that even planned interruptions in antiretroviral therapy based on CD4 count led to an HIV-specific and non-HIV-specific disease progression and increased but the flip side to this is that there are a number of risks to antiretroviral therapy in the ICU as well. And I think these can really be divided into two categories. 
immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, and pharmacology. So immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, or IRIS, is really a disease or pathogen-specific inflammatory response that's triggered by the initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Clinically, it can present in a number of ways, but relevant to the ICU, it can present as pneumonitis, which can lead to ARDS, meningitis in patients who have TB or cryptococcus, and hepatitis can be seen as well. Risk factors for IRIS include initiation, initiating art near treatment for an acute opportunistic infection, lower CD4 count, and a rapid decline in viral load. And the pathogenesis of this is still unclear. Now, with respect to pharmacology, there's a lot of concerns about drug toxicities and drug-to-drug -drug interactions in the ICU. Polypharmacy and organ dysfunction can lead to impaired efficacy of ART and toxicity can lead to lactic acidosis and liver. So now the overall recommendations are for patients who are already on antiretroviral therapy with viral suppression, if you feel ART can be continued safely, then you should in patients who present with an AIDS-related disease, then you should consider starting antiretroviral therapy. And in patients who present with a non-AIDS-related disease, if their CD4 count is less than 200, then you should also consider starting. Now, I think the, the two main points I kind of I want to make from this is, as I mentioned earlier, up to 40% of HIV patients don't know that they have HIV when they're admitted to the so I think as ICU providers, it's very important for us to have a low threshold for testing for this. And the initiation, continuation, or interruption of antiretroviral therapy in the ICU really needs to be done on a basis and with the consultation of an HIV. So as critically ill HIV patients are living longer and surviving their critical illness, as providers, we need to start thinking about long-term outcomes such as health-related quality of life and functional status. In the post-ART era, studies have shown that critically ill, up to 70% of critically ill HIV patients are alive at two years. But there's very little reported on the quality of life of these survivors. Some predictors of worse long-term survival, advanced HIV AIDS, lower CD4 count, poor functional status, and a higher severity. So in conclusion, antiretroviral therapy has increased life expectancy for HIV-infected patients. This has led to an increase in the non-HIV chronic diseases that these patients are developing. This change has also led to an increase in ICU admission for these non-AIDS causes. ICU survival has increased for HIV patients, but the impact of antiretroviral therapy on, in the ICU is still constant. And finally, I think we just need more information on the quality of life and functional status of HIV-infected ICU. So with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to.